here this morning. So come on in, grab a seat. We're going to do a little little church history this morning. Uh, as we get started here, let me go ahead and have somebody pass out some handouts for us, if I could. Anybody want to help? You already got some already? You got everybody? Okay. Well, there's more coming in. Here you go, Ray. Pass those out for me. Thanks. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Again, if you're out in the lobby and you want to come in for Sunday school, this is the moment. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you so much and we're so thankful for all of your work in our lives. Lord, as we've been studying the concept of marriage and looking at biblical texts throughout these last 12 weeks or so, 11 weeks or so, Lord, we are deeply impressed with how important marriage is to you, with how precious it is to your own heart, Heavenly Father. Thinking back a few weeks to even the story of the creation in Genesis chapter 2 and you making Eve, especially for Adam, how you made her out of a rib of her husband, Heavenly Father, that rib symbolizing protection and the guarding of the heart, Heavenly Father. We have seen throughout the weeks examples of Christian marriages even here at Gospel Fellowship as we've interviewed and, and been able to discuss important concepts related to the marriage covenant, even as uh, we've, uh, again, just thank you for the examples of those who have strong marriages here. Uh, Lord, we thank you that marriage is something that points typologically to the Lord Jesus Christ for his great love for the church, his elect. We thank you that we've seen that in the book of Revelation as well. We've seen Christ and we've seen his bride, and even as uh, we think on these great things, Lord, draw us higher to you, deeper into the truth. Lord, help us, for those of us who are married here, to love our, our wives as Christ loved the church. And Lord, we, we pray also for wives that they would honor their husbands as is becoming of them according to the book of Ephesians and other places, Heavenly Father. And now, Lord, as we look to a historical example of marriage, I pray, Father, that you would be with me, help me to be accurate in all that I say, forgive me if I err in any way, and bless us today in our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, our introduction will be short. Last week, we, um, we looked at Proverbs chapter 31 and the example of the godly wife that's given there in, in that section of the, of the Proverbs. This morning, I would like to give an historical example of a, of a woman who largely embodies the spirit of Proverbs chapter 31 without any question. In fact, in the last few weeks in our marriage class, we've looked at biblical data. Again, we've looked at examples of marriages here in the congregation. We've looked at marriage from various perspectives. One thing we have not done is we're going to look at an example, a historical example. So I've chosen Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. Not a surprise. I was actually looking for an opportunity to lecture on this. I think you're really going to appreciate this. Um, Jonathan Edwards, of course, being one of the, the main obsessions of my life in terms of my academic study and publishing and things like that. I've never actually taught on Sarah Edwards before, so I'm pretty excited to do that this morning. The phrase an uncommon union comes from something that Jonathan said about his marriage to Sarah a little bit later, and we'll get there when we get there. I have a lot to say this morning, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. Jonathan Edwards wrote something about Sarah Edwards very early on. In fact, in 1723, when Edwards was just a young man, he wrote a document that is now called the Apostrophe to Sarah Pierpont, or sometimes it's called simply On Sarah Pierpont. Now, we don't have this document anymore. It was lost to history wherever he wrote it. We think it was on the flyleaf of a book. It has been lost. But thankfully, one of his earlier biographers recovered this text before it dissipated into church history in, in the abyss and was lost to history. But one of his earlier biographers thankfully preserved this. Now, this is what Edward says, okay? So he's 20 years old here when he writes this. And it's almost assuredly about Sarah Pierpont, who's going to become his wife. And this is a bit of a paragraph here, so let me read this. They say, Edwards writes, there is a young lady in New Haven who is beloved of that almighty being, 
who made and rules the world, and that there are certain seasons in which this great being, that is, that's to say God, right, in some way or other invisible, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight, and that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him, that she expects, after a while, to be received up where he is, to be raised out of the world and caught up into heaven, being assured that he loves her too well to let her remain at a distance from him always. There, she is to dwell with him and to be ravished with his love, favor, and delight forever. Therefore, if you present all the world before her with the riches of its treasures, she disregards it and cares not for it and is unmindful of any pain or affliction. She has a a strange sweetness in her mind and sweetness of temper uncommon, purity in her affections. Notice the word uncommon there. That's going to come back again later. It is most just and praiseworthy in all her actions, and you could not persuade her to do anything thought wrong or sinful if you could give her all the world, lest she should offend this great being. She is of a wonderful sweetness, calmness, and universal benevolence of mind, especially after those times in which this great God has manifested himself to her, to her mind. She will sometimes go about singing sweetly from place to place and seems to be always full of joy and pleasure and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone and to wander in the fields and on the mountains and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Now that is Jonathan Edwards writing at age 20 about Sarah Pierpont, age 13 at that time. Okay, So he falls in love with this young girl from New Haven, quite, uh, quite young she is. Now, Claghorn, who is the editor of volume 16 of the works of Jonathan Edwards, that would be Edwards' collection of personal writings, a lot of letters and the documents, including Edwards' di- diary and things like that, says this about the apostrophe. On Sarah Pierpont is an excellent example of the Puritan plain style. Its lyric qualities invite oral recitation. Originally untitled, its subject is traditionally considered to be Sarah Pierpont. Well, that's almost without any dispute whatsoever. Who became Edwards' wife in 1727. Although the original is no longer extant, Edwards is thought to have written the tribute on a blank end paper of a book that he probably presented to her. If the assumed date of writing sometime in 1723 is correct, she was 13 years old and he was 20. He had known her since taking up his residence at Yale College in 1719, okay? Now, this is also very interesting, I think, because it gives us a little bit of a clue into Edwards' heart as a lover. Typically, we think of him, of course, as a Reformed theologian, the preacher of sinners in the hands of an angry God, a serious and uh, even grave man he's often described of, but here... In this document, we see Edwards' romantic side. Now, George Marsden, who wrote one of the best biographies of Jonathan Edwards, it's called Jonathan Edwards' A Life, he says this, Sarah was the perfectly embodied ideal of all that he aspired to be, the pure spiritual being, sweet-tempered, singing sweetly, always full of joy and pleasure. The last sentence of conversing with gods in the fields is strikingly a mere image of Edwards himself. Okay, so what does Edwards love about this 13-year-old girl? Now, 13 is a little young. I think we all recognize there's a little bit of an awkwardness. Not so much in the 1700s to be 13 is almost of marriable age, okay, almost there. It is a little young, but, but she's almost of marriable age. What does he see in this 13-year-old girl, and, and where does he see it, and what does he love? Well, what Edwards fell in love with was not necessarily her physical beauty, though we're actually going to suggest later on that she was quite physically beautiful. Edwards loves her soul. Edwards loves the fact that she loves the Lord. Okay, so how did they, how did they meet? Well, let's talk a little bit about Sarah Edwards' background and where she came from, and then we'll get into their love story and their, their famous marriage together. So Sarah is born, just to frame this up contextually in terms of church history here, she's born January 9th of 1710, and she lives until October 2nd of 1758, where she dies. Her death is tragic, and again, we're going to cover that, Lord willing, if we have time. Her father is a pastor, and that's interesting because Jonathan's father was also a pastor. So Jonathan Edwards' father, Timothy Edwards, was a pretty serious Puritan colonial pastor. 
So also is Sarah Edwards' father a pastor. So they have that in common. They're both PKs, right? They're both preacher's kids. Uh, So Reverend James Pierpont is her father. Mary Pierpont is her mother of New Haven. We do have some portraits painted of them. I wish the screen were a little bit brighter here, but one of the things that you can notice is that her mom is actually strikingly beautiful. And again, Sarah Pierpont is described as beautiful herself as well. Her grandfather is Thomas Hooker. Now, if you remember some of your early colonial history, he is one of the founders of Connecticut as a colony in and of itself, okay? Her father, again, Reverend James Pierpont, is one of the founders of Yale. So Sarah comes from a a family that today we would say is obviously very historically significant, okay? Her father having helped to found Yale, her grandfather having founded uh, the, the colony of Connecticut, And from what we know about Sarah, she seems to have been a very spiritual person, even from the time she was young. From the age of six, she had first described what she calls an experience of heavenly Elysium, which is to say some kind of a Holy Spirit's empowered, almost ecstatic experience of the joy of being in Christ. Now, that's what Edward said of her. Remember, as he describes her in the somewhat poetic apostrophe to Sarah Pierpont that he apparently scrawls on the flyleaf of a book, that's what he loves about her. He loves the fact that even at age 13, she seems to have converse with the Lord God. In other words, she prays constantly. She's of a spiritual nature. She seems to be taken up in the things of the Lord. Um, At age six, that seems a little bit young for somebody to have a powerful spiritual experience, but not necessarily too young. Of course, the Lord can work in people's lives from a very young age. And so all of this seems to be in concert with what Edward says that he loves about her. Well, as far as we know, the, the, the chance that he met her at Yale while Edwards was studying is, is fairly strong, okay? So Edwards comes to Yale for both his bachelor's degree and his master's degree. He takes two degrees there. Edwards went to Yale, I think, when he was 17, if I'm not mistaken. He's pretty young to be in college as far as today's standards go. Maybe even a little earlier than that, I could be wrong. But one of the nearer churches to Yale, where Edwards is studying, is Sarah Edwards' dad's church, the church in New Haven. So probably what happens, to the best we know, is that while Edwards is studying at Yale, he attends the New Haven congregation. Obviously, he has great respect for her father, and he seems to have fallen in love with the pastor's daughter during his time there, okay? Now, skipping ahead a bit, they end up getting married several years later. So remember, he wrote the apostrophe what year? 1723, when he's 20 and she's 13. He ends up getting engaged to her and marries her July 28th of 1727, while Edwards was an associate pastor, okay? So Edwards has just recently taken up his first call. His grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, is the senior pastor at the Northampton congregation. And so Sarah then goes from New Haven, where she grew up, to marry Jonathan Edwards. They go to, they go to Northampton together, and she basically marries a pastor, right? So her life is almost completely either the pastor's daughter or the pastor's wife. That's essentially her vocation and calling in life. Sarah was 17 when she actually got married, and Jonathan was 24. That sounds a little bit better than 20 and 13 to the modern ear, right? Seven years difference, though. So she's a little bit younger than him. And together, they're going to have 11 children. Now, that's interesting, too, because Jonathan was one of 11 children. So they have 11 children together. They have eight girls, mostly girls, and three boys. There must have been something in the family because Jonathan Edwards, he's the only boy out of 11 children. So he had 10 sisters growing up. They called him the 10 or the 60 feet of Edwards sisters because they're all tall. So they have 11 children. Now, here's what's cool. All 11 children survive infancy. And again, in that day, that's a pretty big deal. Okay, so to go through together 11 conceptions and live births and survive all of it is amazing. And all 11 children live. That's like really, really saying something. Now, actually, a couple of their children are going to die, but we're going to come to that a little bit later. But again, they all survive infancy. Now, I did some research just because I'm interested in the researchers out there, so might as well put it together for you. Here's what happened to all 11 of their children if you're wondering how they grew up. So Sarah, the oldest child, this would be Sarah Parsons. She marries a guy called Elihu Parsons. 
She, as the oldest sister of 11, basically spends most of her childhood tutoring the other children. Okay, so when you're, when you're having a child every other year or so, the first one you have to heavily lean on for dependence. So Sarah is constant, she's strong, she tutors all the other children, she travels often, and she herself is going to have, guess what, 11 children. Isn't that interesting? So Edwards has 11, he has 11, or Edwards is one of 11, she has 11, then his daughter has 11 children too, so that's pretty cool. Jerusha is probably the most interesting child, in my opinion. Jerusha is the flower of the family, she has the best personality, she's lovable, she's spiritual, Everybody thinks Jerusha is just gorgeous and sweet. She is the one who dies at age 18. And interestingly enough, she probably fell in love with David Brainerd, the missionary. Now, David Brainerd was uh, a devotee of Edwards' theology, and David Brainerd ends up becoming a missionary to the Native Americans. When he died of consumption or tuberculosis, he comes to the Edwards' house basically to die. He ends up convalescing there, and he he never gets well. And Jerusha becomes his nurse, and they probably ended up falling in love. And we don't know that for sure. Maybe it was purely platonic, but all the indications are that they fell in love. But because of his dying of tuberculosis, he ends up giving tuberculosis to Jerusha, who also dies of the same thing. And so one of the reasons we think they might have fallen in love is because they're either buried right next to each other or perhaps in the same grave, okay? So that would be a a way of suggesting that their love transcends this life. Esther Burr, she marries Aaron Burr. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Aaron Burr, the vice president, right? No, that's their son. Okay, so Aaron Burr Sr., he's going to become the president of Princeton. His son is Aaron Burr Jr. That's the vice president who famously got in the duel with Alexander Hamilton. You remember that from history? Okay, they're going to come back into the story. Hang on. Mary, the fourth child, she has 13 children. She's one of the most proliferous parents in the whole Edwards family. Lucy, I don't know a lot about her. She marries a guy called Woodbridge. She has nine children, so they're just like having babies like crazy. This is an amazing, amazingly blessed family. Timothy is the first son. So this is the first time Jonathan has a son. Praise God for that, right? He becomes a farmer and a merchant and ends up taking on the vocation of a judge. Next, we have Susanna Porter, who ends up, when she gets married, starting a furniture shop. They have six children together. Eunice, the eighth child, another girl. I know very little about her. I couldn't find much about her. Jonathan Jr., the ninth child, is very significant in history because Not only is he another one of the rare sons of Jonathan Edwards, there's going to end up being three, but he becomes the one child that takes on his father's vocation and ends up becoming a pastor. Okay, so Jonathan Edwards Jr., named after his father, he becomes a pastor, and he is one of the leading cutting edge of abolitionist teachers. So one of his primary claims to fame is that even though Jonathan Edwards He and Sarah actually owned slaves, unfortunately, for the sake of history. We can at least say that Jonathan Jr. was on the cutting edge of the abolitionist movement. He becomes the president of Union College. And Jonathan Edwards Jr., very interesting person because he ends up learning multiple Native American languages. And in addition to his pastoral duties and his work in abolitionism, He writes a grammar that is helpful for future uh, missionaries who are going to go out to the Indians and be able to preach the gospel to them. So he has the advantage of being raised around the Indians. He becomes a linguist, transcribes their language into written form, and writes a grammar that's going to be very, very helpful to other missionaries in the future. Okay, Um, Elizabeth, or Betty as she was called, she was the one child who has ill health for most of her childhood. She only lived to 15 years old, but her parents never saw her when she died, okay? So she actually dies after Jonathan Edwards and Sarah died. So so fortunately, I guess we should say, they did not have to suffer the grief of that loss. The only child that dies while they're alive is Jerusha, the flower of the family. And then finally, there's Pinty or Pierpont Edwards. This is their youngest child, the third boy then. A Pinty takes up with the Continental Army, again, the Revolutionary Wars after Jonathan Edwards dies in 1758. He becomes an attorney. He joins the House of Representatives and eventually serves in the U.S. District Court. Put all that data together, and the Edwards and their 11 children are a 
historically very significant family very early on in the colonial period. Okay, So this is why Edwards is, is well known. Not only does he do great work in terms of his writing, his preaching, his work in the revivals, but obviously his family has quite the legacy of influence in the, the colonial period into the early Americas, okay? Now, let's think about Sarah Edwards' wife, uh, life here just for a moment. If you're just joining us right now, the reason we're looking at Sarah Edwards and Jonathan is an, is a, is an example of a strong marriage, and particularly an example of Proverbs 31, which we looked at last week in our, in our study on, on marriage. In fact, why don't we go ahead and grab our Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 31. I want to pick up just a little bit of language here. Um, related to Sarah Edwards, the pastor's wife. Sarah, in my view, is a pretty stellar example of what the Proverbs commend here in, in Proverbs chapter 31. Now, last week as we were reading this text, we found that the, the model wife here in Proverbs 31 is almost impossible to emulate in one's life. She seems so busy, where does she even sleep, right? Because look at Proverbs 31, an excellent wife who can find she's worth more than precious jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. He will have no lack of grain. She does him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. And then the finale here, charm is deceitful deceitful and beauty is vain, but the woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Well, my goodness, almost everything it says there in Proverbs 31 seems to have been exemplified in the life of Sarah Edwards. She's almost an extraordinary person here. Now, let's just kind of picture what her day might have been like. So we know that they had a farm, a pretty significantly sized farm. But as you're going to see, Jonathan Edwards himself almost never actually takes up tool in hand and works the farm himself, except for we know that he did like to split wood from time to time, just mostly for exercise for the sake of the the vigor, vigor of his physical body. But almost the totality of the of the household chores were performed by Sarah and the children, okay? So she has this farm, she's got crops, and she has animals to maintain. Now, we do know that they did own slaves. At least one slave that we know of is called Venus, and the reason that we know her name is because we do actually still have a receipt for the purchase and the acquisition of Venus. Again, this is kind of a low spot in Edwardsian study, but we can talk about that some other time. Uh, Sarah's job is to maintain the farm. She's raising the children. She's also catechizing and discipling all 11 children. She is buying and selling goods at market. We know that at least once a year, usually in May or early spring, she went to Boston to make a, a basically a shopping run. Uh, she would go and she would acquire whatever goods they would need for their farm or for the sake of their family. And not only that, but as if that isn't enough, okay, running the farm and the children and and taking care of everything, probably making all of their clothes by hand. We know that she also started a small business at one point. She had to because the Edwardses were struggling financially when they went to Stockbridge. But she and the daughter start their own small business of making paper and silk fans that they would sell for other dainty women to buy to fan themselves with. So they have this little small business on the side, kind of an early Etsy shop or something like that, if you can, if you can think of it that way. Okay? 
Now, where's Jonathan when she's out doing all this hard work? Wives are elbowing their husbands right now. Well, Jonathan the genius is working in his study reputedly 13 hours a day in his study. Sometimes he didn't even come to dinner. He didn't want to come to dinner because he could not possibly be interrupted. Now, the famous um, assessment of him working 13 hours a day in the study, that may be slightly apocryphal, but probably not too much from what we know about Jonathan Edwards. It was his disciple Samuel Hopkins who says that, that he studied for 13 hours a day. And Jonathan was so austere in his, even his diets that he maintained exactly what he ate because he didn't want to be interrupted by the digestive processes. In other words, he didn't want to eat something that's going to cause him upset or have to go to the bathroom more than would be necessary. So Jonathan is so focused on writing his treatises and his sermons and his letters and all of his correspondences that uh, he's almost constantly in the study. Now, it's not that he wasn't a good dad. Okay? Everything that we know about him suggests that he, he was a good and loving father. But Samuel Hopkins says this, and this is a bit of a slight, I think, on Jonathan, even though Samuel Hopkins' early biographer looks up to him. He was less acquainted with most of his temporal affairs than many of his neighbors, and he seldom knew when and by whom his forage for winter was gathered in or how many milk kind he had, or whence his table was furnished. So Jonathan is so busy taking up his writing and his discourses that he almost doesn't know whether it's his cow or the neighbor's cow that's loose. I think I read one place that he wasn't exactly sure where his own property line was because he just wasn't really into that kind of thing. If there was ever anything that needed to be done, if there was ever anything that needed to be maintained, it was Sarah Edwards who came along and took care of that, just sort of recognizing that her husband was called by God to be something special, possibly even recognizing that he was going to have some sort of historical influence. Now, thinking of her personality here, what do we know about her? Well, all from a lot of secondhand writing about her, but here's what we know. She was physically beautiful, okay? Every account that mentions Sarah remarks upon the fact that she is strikingly good-looking. She is a physically beautiful and attractive person. She is charming and endearing. Again, almost universally, if somebody wrote anything about Sarah, it's that she was very lovable and kind to everyone that she meets. She is extremely devoted to Jonathan as her husband. Okay, that's going to be, the, if, you, if, if there's one thing you can do to make Sarah mad, say something about her husband, and that, that's going to be a, a problem for you. We are told that she loved music and singing, and there were at least a couple of occasions in which if Jonathan rebuked her, she would be very deeply hurt because she so highly esteemed her husband's affections for her. There's at least one account where Sarah, in what she thought was a hallway conversation or kind of a side room conversation, she, men she mentioned something less than extolling about another minister, and Jonathan rebuked her for it. He took her aside, and he rebuked her for it. Jonathan has not anything like an egalitarian conception of society, but Jonathan is, quite honestly, an elitist who viewed himself and other clergy members as being the ranking authorities in their society. Okay? Jonathan ha thought highly of clergy. Of course, he was a clergyman himself. His father was. His grandfather was. And so for Sarah to say something unbecoming of another pastor, that was a moment where we know he rebuked her and she was deeply hurt by that and had to kind of grieve that, what she took to be a deep insult for, for several weeks. She was very bothered by that. Jonathan describes her as being often prone to melancholy, which does seem to counter what other things we know about her, about being so charming and endearing. And Sarah did have from time to time to suffer from the resentments of the parishioners in the church. There's a subtext in Jonathan Edwards' studies that he's almost very frequently at ends with his own congregation about his salary. And whenever Sarah would show up with a new dress or a new piece of jewelry, there would always be some rumblings in the murmuring of the congregation of resentment about that. And so Sarah did sometimes have to suffer from the, the whisperings and sort of the gossip of the local church, particularly about her, her clothing. Now, there's also a, a rival family, the Williams clan, which the Edwardses are going to constantly struggle with. And of course, Sarah would get caught up in that, especially whenever it would become personal about Jonathan. 
If ever anything was personal about Jonathan, that hurt her very deeply. When Jonathan was fired from the Northampton congregation in 1750 over the communion controversy, as you can imagine, that was deeply painful for Sarah to see the congregation that Jonathan had pastored for 23 years eventually turn on him and end up firing him related to his doctrine of of communion. And so what happens to Jonathan and Sarah as a married couple is they actually have to leave Northampton and they they actually have to replace themselves to the Stockbridge Mission, which at that time is kind of on the fringe of society on the western edge. And so Sarah essentially has to lose her position, not only in the church, but also in society as she's basically and Jonathan are moved out to the frontier to become frontier missionaries. So you can imagine how uh, painful that would be to lose your house, to lose your, your status, and everything you'd worked for for 23 years together when your husband gets fired. So here are a few things that she says she resents kind of in her own words. Uh, at times she struggles with the ill treatment of the town. She finds herself somewhat gossiped about from time to time. She's concerned for her own good name and the fair reputation among men, and especially the esteem and judge just treatment of the people of the town. So again, you kind of get the idea that, that maybe there's some picking on her that takes place. Again, anything related to the ill will of her husband, and especially uh, she d- greatly desires the esteem and kind treatment of her, of her husband. Um, most of that what we read is that he totally loved her, but every once in a while, if he would have to say a, a, a less than kind word, again, that would, that, would, that would hurt her significantly. Now, in addition to everything that I mentioned about her regular household duties and her responsibilities with raising the children and with the farm, we also know that the Edwards family very, very commonly took up borders to come live in their own home and to study under Jonathan Edwards. In that time, there were a couple different ways that a person could get seminary education. One of those ways is to go off to Europe, and you could, of course, train in one of the European seminaries, though that would be cost prohibitive for a lot of people. Another way that you could be seminary trained is you could go and you could study at uh, Yale or or Princeton or Harvard. The other way is what they called the log college method, was where you would go to live with a pastor and you'd simply train with him and study with him. And, And the Edwards is they did open up their, t- their home from time to time to have students come to live in their house. George Whitfield is not one of those students, but he did make a famous visit in 1740. George Whitfield was probably the most famous person on planet Earth at that time. He was the well-known revivalist. He comes through in 1740 in the peak of the revival, and of course he comes to stay at the Edwards' house. So what does Sarah do? She's got to switch into host, hostess with the mostest mode, And she's got to put on, in her own home, cooking and feeding him, the most famous person alive on planet Earth at that time. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Uh, Brainerd comes for two years, 1746 to 1747. Imagine somebody showing up at your house, knock, knock, I'd love to stay with you for a couple of years if that's all right. And by the way, I'm struggling with this deep cough and, and I'm coughing up blood. I think I've got tuberculosis. So that's what happens. He comes and he, he lives with the Edwardses and he dies in their home with a contagious disease. Other young ministers that came and lived at the Edwards's home, uh, Samuel Hopkins and Joseph Bellamy, those would be two men that are pretty much devoted to Edwards' theology. And they, um, after Edwards dies, carry on his theological legacy. And um, Hopkins helps biographically writing one of the earlier biographies of Jonathan Edwards. Now, when Whitfield comes through town, the most famous man on earth, he is a single itinerant preacher who's famous in England and in the colonies. He is not married, though he wants to be. And he says this of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards' marriage. He says, quote, A sweeter couple I have not seen. Mrs. Edwards is adorned with a meek and quiet spirit, she talked solidly of the things of God and seemed to be such a helpmeet, that's the word from Genesis 2, right, in the King James, for her husband that she caused me to renew those prayers which for some months I have put up to God that he would be pleased to send me a daughter of Abraham to be my wife. What did, what did he just say? He basically said, I'm so impressed with Sarah Edwards and the wife she is to Jonathan Edwards that I think I'm going to start praying about God giving me a wife again. I think I'd like to have one 
two. Okay, so that's a pretty high compliment for Whitfield to say about Sarah Edwards. By the way, notice this line. She talked solidly of the things of God. What do you suppose that means? That means that in addition to everything else she did, that she could converse, she could hold solid doctrinal conversation of the things of the Lord. She was deeply conversant with Scripture and Reformed theology. She can hold her weights when talking with the other men about the things of the Lord. That's a deep compliment for Whitfield to give to Sarah Edwards, I think. Now, Samuel Hopkins, one of the earlier biographers, he has a few things to say about Sarah as well, and it's always complimentary, everything he says. In fact, it almost seems like he has a bit of a crush on Sarah Edwards. I may be reading into it a little too deeply here, but everything he says is so glowing about Sarah Edwards. She had the law of kindness on her tongue. That's a paradox, isn't it? The law of kindness, especially when referring to the raising of their children. She was both strict, but very kind in her strictness is what he's saying there. She had an excellent way of governing her children. And this statement, I think, very significant here. A more than ordinarily beautiful person of a pleasant, agreeable countenance. What is he saying? She's a very attractive person. She has a very pretty face, is what he's trying to say. Definitely seems like Samuel Hopkins thinks very highly of Sarah. Okay. Now, if you think everything was always great for Sarah Edwards, clearly it was not. Okay. Their life is filled with a lot of pain. There's a lot of deep distresses. Probably the most significant thing that she endures is the death of Jerusha. Uh, again, if you came in late, Jerusha dies at age 18 from tuberculosis. She's the one who probably fell in love with David Brainerd. She catches tuberculosis from him. She essentially serves as his nurse as he is dying in their home. And she dies very, very shortly thereafter. So this is the pain of having probably one of your favored children, to be honest, die at an age in which they're of marriable age, probably should be falling in love and getting married, and everything falls apart for Jerusha. So, Jerusha, so, there, so there's that pain there. This is a little bit personal, but again, we do have some medical receipts from time to time, they would have to make some emergency trips to Boston to procure medicine. And it seems as though, just reading back into the medical transcripts, that she either suffered from a lot of uh, UTIs, which is to say uterine tract infections, or possibly miscarriages. We're not exactly sure, but she seems to have needed quite a bit of gynecological assistance. So she often has to, to make trips to Boston for that. Of course, the suffering of Jonathan's firing from Northampton in 1750. If you're not familiar with why Edwards got fired, basically it's this. He wanted to move from an um, a open communion system that his grandfather Solomon Stoddard had set up, reverting back to the previous practice of a closed table communion wherein people had to profess faith in Christ before they were permitted to come to the table. Edwards thought Solomon Stoddard, his grandfather, had made a mistake there. And so when he tries to revert back to a stricter communion policy, okay, that you, you can't come to the Lord's table without first going to the elders to share your testimony of conversion, the church had uh, really resented that change and ended up turning against Edwards. And despite his best attempts, they fired him for that change in 1750. Okay? And then finally, her greatest suffering is going to be the dreadful year. That is 1757 to 1758. We're going to come to that here as we go. Now, I was reading through, the, through volume 16 on the letters of Jonathan Edwards, and I only found a couple of those letters that he wrote to Sarah. And that makes sense because most of the time they're together. So why would he be writing his own wife letters? Well, occasionally he does, and I think there's three or so of them. Uh, sometimes Sarah gets a letter when she goes to Boston and stays away, or sometimes he will write while he's itinerant preaching and she's at home. But nevertheless, here's one. And, and it's not that this letter says anything really significant other than it gives you a glimpse into their lives. And I think you'll find that maybe your own marriage is kind of resembled here a little bit. So things don't really change all that much, do they? Well, here's a letter dated June 22nd, 1748 from Edwards to Sarah. Quoting, My dear companion, I wrote you a few lines the last Sabbath day by Ensign, Timothy Dwight Jr., which I hope you will receive. 
By this, I would inform you that Betty, Elizabeth Edwards, remember Betty's the youngest child, or one of the youngest, she's the one that's always sick, seems really to be mending uh, now. I can't but think that she is truly better, both as to her health and her sores. And we don't know what that means. Really interesting. Something she had, a physical ailment with sores. Since she has been with Mrs. Phelps, The first two or three days before she was well acquainted, she was very unquiet, but now more quiet than she used to be at home. This is lecture day morning, and your two eldest daughters went to bed last night, both sick, and Rose beat out and having the headache. We got Hannah Root to help them yesterday in the afternoon. That seems to be a tutor that their family would employ from time to time, and expect her to come over again today. How Sarah and Esther do today, I cannot tell, for they are not awake yet. We have been without you almost as long as we know how to be, but yet are willing that you should obey the calls of providence with regard to Colonel Stoddard, John Stoddard. If you have money to spare, and it be not too late, I should be glad if you would buy us some cheese in Boston and send it with other things, if it can be safely." Give my humble service to Mr. Edward Bromfield and Madam Abigail Coney Bromfield and proper salutations to other friends. I am your most affectionate companion, Jonathan Edwards. Okay, So letter from Jonathan to Sarah. Now what I think is very interesting about that is they're struggling with the same things that we all struggle with. They've got sick kids. Okay, uh, They've got Betty, who's almost never doing well. Something about these bodily sores. Again, not exactly clear what disease or illness she might have there. The two oldest daughters who would be very important to keeping the household going, they're sick. They went to bed tired and hurting last night. They wake up this morning and they're sick. And so Edwards is simply writing to his sweet wife and letting them know that they're barely holding it together while she's away. Probably the most, the most precious line here is that we have been without you almost as long as we know how to be. Very sweet. And then, of course, he tags on a little grocery list at the end. By the way, if you're out, please pick up some cheese. Okay? Can't get that in Northampton, but go get the good stuff while you're in Boston. And this is just a sweet little piece of history there from Jonathan to Sarah. Now, I'm going to hurry here. I've got I've to go. In the Great Awakening, this is the moment, the big moment where the awakening swings through. Now, it was preceded by the local revival in 1735 in Edwards' home church. That's where it all starts. And five to seven years later, this revival becomes basically national, sweeps through all of the colonies. Whitfield comes, Edwards preaches sinners in the hands of an angry God, and Sarah has her own moment of spiritual ecstasy while Edwards is away. Here's how it happened. While Jonathan was away doing itinerant preaching, that is to say he goes around to other congregations and preaches the gospel to them, well, they got to get a guest, a guest preacher, right? So Northampton gets Samuel Buell, who's a young pastor, okay, a young guy. He comes and he's going to preach a few Lord's Days for the Edwardses and for the Northampton church. And you know what? He preaches fire while Edwards is gone. It's awesome. And the congregation seems to be revived when their own pastor leaves and goes away for a bit. Now, all of a sudden, they're reviving again. So how does that make Sarah feel? Well, remember, the one thing she cannot stand is any rivalry to her husband, okay? So at first, she sinks into this deep jealousy that Samuel Buell is just preaching fire and people are really, really benefiting from it. And then as she catches herself feeling resentful and bitter and angry that he's having success while Jonathan's gone, she resigns herself totally to the Lord And that's when revival sweeps over her and she has almost a two-week ecstatic spiritual experience, which she ends up writing down to describe for Jonathan. And when he comes back, he writes out her spiritual experience in one of his famous books, Some Thoughts on the Revival, 1742. Now, for the sake of time, I had three quotations I was going to read here, and they're all great. I'm only going to read one of these just to give you a sense of what Sarah experiences here because I do want to get to the end of their lives, which is very poignant. But this is Jonathan writing about Sarah. And as he writes this in his book, he does not indicate that it's his wife. Okay, He he guards her identity. He just describes this as a person who went through this. But it's it's Sarah. We know that. 
Sarah experienced, quote, very frequent dwelling for some considerable time together in such views of the glory of the divine perfections and Christ's excellencies that the soul in the meantime has been, as it were, perfectly overwhelmed and swallowed up with light and love and sweet solace, rest and joy of soul that was altogether unspeakable and more than once continued for five or six hours together without any interruption and that clear and lively view or sense of the infinite beauty and amiableness of Christ's person and the heavenly sweetness of his excellent and transcendent love so that, to use the person's own expressions, the soul remained in a kind of heavenly Elysium. Remember, she experienced that when she was six. Now she's having it again. And did, as it were, swim in the rays of Christ's love like a little moat swimming in the beams of the sun or streams of his light that have come in at the window and the heart was swallowed up in a kind of glow of Christ's love coming down from Christ's heart in heaven as a constant stream of sweet light and the same time the soul all flowing out in love to him. And so on he goes for page after page after page. At one point he he writes a three-page sentence discussing uh, Sarah's ecstatic experiences during that time in the revival. We're going to skip ahead here a little bit. I wanted to show you the only portrait that we have of Sarah Edwards because it's very interesting. This is a painting, an oil painting done by the artist Joseph Badger in 1751. She's 41 years old here, okay? She's already had all 11 children by this point that she has painted. Several things are remarkable, uh, remarkable about this. First of all, we notice the, the interesting, beautiful dress. It has sort of a plunging neckline there. Um, her hair is down, a little bit different, a little bit more casual than some of the paintings at that time. If you look carefully, and again, you can't really see on the screen here, but she's wearing either some rouge on her cheeks or perhaps she has a very ruddy complexion. It's hard to tell. This dress that, we're, that she's wearing was actually later cut up into pieces by her family so that each person could have a piece of mom's dress. They did that several years later at a family reunion. And they got these oil paintings done probably at one of her trips to Boston. Uh, We think it was in the month of May. And again, this is the only portrait we have of her from real life. And the only reason they could afford it, because the Edwards has struggled financially later on, is that they had a Scottish philanthropist called William Hogg, who was very much enchanted with Edwards' writings, and he ends up becoming their financial patron to, to basically supply them whenever things would run thin financially speaking, and he's the one who commissioned Jonathan and Sarah to have their their portraits done, okay? Um, Let me get to their death, because this is pretty moving. So Jonathan and Sarah, they're basically forced out to the frontier when he's fired. He has to go take up the only call he can find, which is the the calling of a, of a, um, a missionary to the Native Americans, the Mohican Indians. And in 1757, a series of events just practically destroys the Edwards family, okay? First, recall that um, Esther had married Aaron Burr Sr., okay? Presbyterian pastor, president of Princeton College. Well, at age 41 or so, he dies. He dies in September of 1757. Now, Edwards is going to be called by Princeton College to replace his son-in-law, Aaron Burr Sr., as the president, a calling which he's not sure he wants. He actually ended up kind of liking it on the frontier more than they thought. Edwards writes some of his best treatises there. But feeling the Lord's call, Jonathan goes to take Aaron Burr Sr.'s place as the president. But as uh, the Lord would have it, Jonathan himself died after just a couple of months. He took a smallpox inoculation that ended up killing him. Okay, so he's, interestingly for our times, he's killed by a vaccine injury. He thought the smallpox inoculation would work, but he was misdosed, and it ended up killing him. So then, what happens next? (sighs) Esther dies. Okay, so the daughter, she ends up dying, leaving two orphans in April of 1758. And then Sarah, our protagonist this morning, She's going to try to put the pieces together. She's going to try to go collect their two children to take them up as orphans and to raise them in addition to her own. Uh, 
But she dies then too. So four deaths in a row in 1757 to 1758. Both, uh, both couples die. Aaron and Esther and then Jonathan and then finally Sarah Edwards die all in a row, leaving an entire crew of orphans for the family to basically have to cobble together and hold it together. So remember all of their children, well, some of them are older by now, but several of them were also still very young. And so Timothy Edwards ends up having to basically become the new father of the entire crew and has to raise most of the, most of the young children himself. Now, before we end up here, I do want to quote to you their last words. They're very, very moving. Uh, Jonathan had a chance to speak before he died. He speaks to his daughter, Lucy, and I don't think he wrote this. I think this is Lucy actually transcribing her father's last words, but this is what he says. Dear Lucy, it seems to me to be the will of God that I should shortly leave you. Therefore, give my kindest love to my dear wife and tell her that the uncommon union, there's those words again, which has so long subsisted between us has been of such a nature as I trust is spiritual and therefore will continue forever. And I hope that she will be supported under so great a trial and submit cheerfully to the will of God. And as to my children, as you know, they are like to be left fatherless, which I hope will be an inducement to you all to seek a father who will never fail you. As to my funeral, I would like it to be like Mr. Burr's with any additional sum of money that it might have been expected to be laid out in that way. I would have disposed to charitable uses. And so therein is the last will and testimony of Jonathan Edwards. Sarah, having heard about Jonathan's death, says this in a letter to Esther. She says, Oh, my very dear child, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him so long. Speaking of Jonathan. But my God lives and he has my heart. Oh, what a legacy my husband and your father has left us. We are all given to God, and there I am, and love to be Sarah Edwards. Now, Esther never read that letter, of course, because she died before, before she even received that. Sarah Edwards then is buried either next to or in the same grave as Jonathan. You can see their grave at Princeton Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey, if you ever go there. Just thinking in 60 seconds or so about her, her legacy then, Sarah leaves to us an incredible legacy that's multifaceted, at least as impressive as Jonathan Edwards' own legacy. Uh, She loved her husband through the many difficulties and trials that they go through as a couple. She is devoted to raising believing children in the Lord, and many of them do go off to do great and wonderful things for the sake of the kingdom. And yet she's not content to live vicariously through her husband's own spirituality, But rather, throughout, she seeks the face of the Lord, her God, and has moving experiences of the same. And she ends up exemplifying Proverbs 31 about as as well as anyone else ever has. And with that, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you, and we thank you for the example of Sarah and Jonathan, a couple who very much lived their lives to the glory of God and for the sake of your kingdom. Help us to go and do likewise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.